Good morning and welcome back to the Monday study group. We were going to finish uh, the Didache today, but the in-person group only got through chapters 10, 11, and 12. Is that right? Yeah, only through 10, 11, and 12. So we will have to take... No, I guess we got through 13. Yeah. So anyway, uh, we didn't finish. <laughs> and I will... Uh, make this video only on the chapters that we covered in the group. And the reason for that uh, not finishing is that the discussions have been very good. Uh, and lots of questions have been asked about the ancient world and what it was like and what people believed and what Gnosticism was. And uh, so I suppose the disadvantage of uh, watching this on a YouTube video is that you don't get to ask those questions uh, and you may be asking them, but I don't get to help you answer them. So hopefully uh, you'll do a little research on the questions that you have and uh, or email me and we can uh, work on the questions that way. Well, all right, uh, let's begin with prayer. God, thank you for this good day. Good because you are good. Good because you created it, you made it and us. And we pray that you would help us this day to live in your grace and love. And because of that grace and love, uh, extend it to our neighbors, to our friends, to those we live with. Uh, may we be as forgiving of others as you have been forgiving of us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. We did sing. Uh, we're back to singing every week. Uh, and we sang morning morning has broken you probably are familiar with that uh that hymn uh, morning has broken like the first morning that one yeah so uh we sang that and uh and then we launched into our discussion starting with chapter 10 and chapter 10 finishes the discussion of the eucharist remember this is a teacher a writer Didache means teaching. We call the writer the Didachist because we don't know his name, probably him, not rather than a her, although there were women teachers and prophets <clears throat> in early Christianity. Uh, their roles got significantly diminished over time, but we know that women could pray and prophesy in church, Paul says, as long as they wore a head covering, which would have been the typical Jewish way to show ref deference to God uh, and to their families. Uh, so I have no problem with understanding that women had leadership and teaching roles, Priscilla and Aquila and so forth. In early Christianity, there's even a woman who's called an apostle uh, in Romans chapter 16, but as time went on, women's roles were more and more restricted. And by the time the Didachist is writing, almost all of the teachers and prophets are men. There are a few exceptions, but most of them are men. So the Didachist is probably a male teacher, and he's finishing up his discussion of how to celebrate the Eucharist for a congregation that are relatively new Christians and have come into Christianity probably out of paganism rather than out of Judaism. The instructions are so basic, uh, it really does imply that the audience needs this instruction about how to do basic things. Uh, and so that's what the Didachist is trying to do. So after the Eucharist and possibly after a community meal that would have been celebrated with it, he says to say grace or to say thanks, to give thanks in this way. Here's what you should say. We thank you, Holy Father, for your sacred name, which you have lodged in our hearts. Uh, literally tabernacled in our hearts, tented in our hearts, come to dwell in our very being. 
We thank you for that. And we thank you for the knowledge and faith in immortality which you have revealed through Jesus, your child. I think it's significant that he mentions knowledge in particularly because we are now in a time when Gnosticism in its Christian form, in its Jewish form, and in its purely philosophical form is are beginning, these different forms of Gnosticism are beginning to flourish and they overlap one another and they are a philosophy that, that promises uh, special knowledge, uh, especially of God and of spiritual things, and also promises secret knowledge that enables the believer, the Gnostic believer, to successfully negotiate the afterlife uh, and the realm of spirits. I don't want to get into it any further than that. There are plenty of good resources on the internet as well as in books on Gnosticism and its relationship to early Christianity. But it was significant, and it may be why this author says to his audience that you thank you, God, that you have given us knowledge. We don't need to go to the Gnostics for that. Uh, we have knowledge because you have made it known to us, along with faith and immortality, through Jesus, your son, your child. To you be glory forever. Then they are instructed to say, Almighty Master, you created everything for the sake of your name, and you have given us food and drink to enjoy that we may thank you. Our way of life should be a way of thanksgiving for all that God has given us. But especially you've given us spiritual food and drink in the Eucharist, in the Lord's Supper that he has just been detailing for them how to um, how to carry out, to practice. You've given us food and drink and eternal life through Jesus, your child. Then he says, somewhat curiously to me, and we can make up a reason why he might say this, but we don't know for sure. Why does he say in verse 4 of chapter 10, and some again, some translations do not have verse numbers, above all, we thank you that you are mighty. Actually, the Greek says something more like, we thank you that you are able or that you are powerful to you be glory forever. Why would the early Christians want to pray that, that God was almighty? Well, I think it's because of the persecutions that they were suffering. And they needed this assurance that God was able to deliver them. And, and if they did suffer persecution, that God would go with them and strengthen them through the time of testing, through the persecution, that they might be able to endure it. To you, Almighty God, we give thanks that you are mighty. Then they are told to pray in these instructions about how to conclude their Eucharist celebration, their Lord's Supper celebration. They're told to to pray, remember, Lord, your church, to save it from all evil and to make it perfect by your love. I like both of those. One is a kind of negative, save us from harm and danger, save us from all that is evil, but also don't just do that, but positively make us more and more like Christ, more and more perfect by your love. Make your church holy and gather it together from the four winds, from north, south, east, and west, from the whole world. Gather your church together into your kingdom, which you have made ready for it. We talked a little bit about the New Testament teaching about the kingdom of God, that Jesus said, for example, that the kingdom was already present. Uh, he said at one, at one point, if I, by the finger of God, cast out demons, then the kingdom of God is among you. Uh, at the opening of Jesus' ministry, he said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. In the New Testament, the kingdom of God is both present and future. 
That is, it is already present where Jesus is present. Wherever the king is, there is the kingdom. So the kingdom of God is already present in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. It's also to come in that we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the kingdom of God is also future. There will be a full realization of the kingdom in the future. And I think that probably it, that future aspect is what the author has in mind here when he prays that God would gather together his church from the four corners of the earth, from the four winds, into your kingdom, which you have made ready for it. The kingdom belongs to the church. The church is not the kingdom of God. The church is the people of the kingdom, uh, but it is not the kingdom itself. The kingdom of God is the perfect rule and reign of God over all things. Finally, he asks the, he teaches the, this community he's writing for to pray, let grace come. That might be a title for Christ. Uh, he does have some unusual titles for Christ here. Let, let grace come and let this world pass away. Or grace could refer to the second coming as a whole. Um, Christians have already received grace. Paul wrote in many of his letters, grace and peace to you. And as prayers for the congregation to whom he was writing. So here Paul says to the community, pray that grace may come and that this world may pass away. In 1 John, it tells us that the king that this world is already passing away uh, in the in the belief and understanding of the earliest Christians uh, that they looked for the end of the of the world as we know it and the beginning of the full realization of God's kingdom when Christ returned. They are to pray Hosanna to the God of David. Uh, that's those, that's a very Jewish way of expressing praise. And we know that even though early Christian congregations were uh, Gentile for the most part, especially by now, uh, they continued to use Aramaic terms, uh, especially like Hosanna and Maranatha which is, comes up right away. He says, our Lord, come. In fact, the Greek text says, Maranatha, our Lord, come. And the prayer concludes with a, a call that if anyone is holy, that is, has been set apart for God, let him come and join in the Eucharist in the community of those celebrating the Lord's Supper but if not, if one is not yet a Christian, then let that person repent and join the community. So it's a call to all people to come and to repent as needed. And amen, the concluding, uh, the concluding word of prayer, so be it. It's a bit ironic to me and a little humorous that at the end of all of these chapters of instructions on how to celebrate the Lord's Supper, starting with chapter 9 and, and the detail given in chapters 9 and 10, at the end of all that, the writer says, in the case of the prophets, however, that is, in view of all that I've said before, in view of the case of the prophets, you should let them give thanks, that is, do Eucharist, celebrate the Lord's Supper, in their own way. Now, that's probably the best translation of the Greek. The Greek could also be translated as often as they will, or as they will. But uh, the translation in... in Cyril Richardson's uh, version of the Didache says, let them give thanks in their own way. That is, 
a prophet has such authority that they can use whatever form of words they choose. They don't have to follow the Didachists' guidelines to this fledgling Christian congregation. All right, chapter 11. We now get into the instructions how to deal with traveling visitors, teachers, apostles, and prophets. So he says to the congregation, you should welcome and receive anyone who comes your way. Welcome them and teach them any, sorry, that anyone who comes their way and teaches them all we have been saying, that is, if somebody comes and teaches according to the instructions that we have given you in the way of life, the two ways, and in these instructions about baptism, fasting, and the Lord's Supper, if they teach what we've been teaching in general, then you should welcome them. But if they prove to teach against the teaching that we have been given, if their teaching contradicts this, then do not pay attention to them. That is, a traveling teacher may come who is a false teacher, according to the Didachus. And of course, we know from the New Testament that Jesus and Paul warn against traveling false teachers. But, he says to them, if the teaching of the visitor furthers the Lord's righteousness, that is the right way to live, and knowledge, and again, there's that word gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, furthers the Lord's righteousness and knowledge, well, then welcome him as if he were the Lord himself. So honor the people who travel and come to teach and help you as long as their teaching is good teaching. And good is judged by what the Didachist has already instructed in the two ways, as well as in these instructions about celebrating baptism, fasting, and the Lord's Supper. So that's a little bit about traveling teachers. What about apostles and prophets? Well, that, again, in this translation that has verse numbers, that starts in verse 3. Now about apostles and prophets. Well, haven't all the apostles died out by the early 2nd century? Yes, it's very likely that there were no living apostles, that is, of the original 12 or 13, depending on how you count Paul and Matthias, uh, and others who were considered apostles. There's a, a list of apostles in at the end of uh, Romans, in Romans 16, uh, people who have been sent out like Barnabas by the church. There were lots of apostles, m- way more than just the 12. The original 12 probably functioned as an authoritative teaching group, but they commissioned others to go out Churches commissioned other people to be sent out, and that's all that the word apostello, apostle, means, is to be sent out. So there were already existing apostles, even after the first generation of apostles had died out. And there were also prophets. Prophets were not predictors of the future, like we use the word prophet. Prophets meant to tell forth the word of God, to speak the word of God, sometimes under the influence of the Holy Spirit, sometimes in ecstatic speech, uh, in a trance or a state of emotional uh, excitement in which they would, under the influence of the Spirit, speak words of admonition, counsel, guidance to local congregations. And apparently these people also traveled and were itinerant. So act in line with the gospel precept means something like uh, act in accordance with what Jesus taught. Uh, And there's teaching about itinerant 
teachers in Act, in Matthew chapter 10, verses 40 and 41, for example, uh, that may mean that that may mean uh, what the writer has in mind in when he says act in line with the gospel precept. That is, there is teaching of Jesus about how to receive and respond to traveling teachers. Excuse me. Welcome every apostle on arriving, just like you would welcome every visitor who comes your way. Welcome them as if they were the Lord. That is, they are authoritative. They, an apostle intends to represent Christ to the church if they are a true apostle. How do you find out if they're a true apostle? Well, that's the concern that our writer has, and he has that concern apparently because there were false apostles. Paul ran into some false apostles that he writes about in 2 Corinthians chapters 10 through 13. But upon arriving, assume that the apostle is genuine. Welcome them as if they were the Lord, but they must, must not stay beyond one day. That's interesting to me because it implies that the Christians were living in community. Our Christian community here only gathers on Sundays. In the church I grew up in, there was a gathering on Wednesdays for prayer meeting, and our youth group met on Saturdays, and then the whole congregation would meet Sunday morning and Sunday evening. So we had at least four opportunities every week to meet together. But if it wasn't a Wednesday or a Saturday or a Sunday, what if a traveling apostle or teacher showed up on a Monday or Tuesday? Well, he says they should only stay one day. That is, they may not be present to address the worshiping community on the Lord's Day. Uh, and it may imply that these Christians are living in community next door to each other in small groups, maybe even living as a community, uh, a Christian community, rather than just being scattered about in a town or city among their neighbors. Christians are close enough that he can give this instruction to say that even if an important a person as an apostle arrives, they should only stay one day. And that means that you'll have to get everybody together to listen to them and to what they have to say and why they've come. They can stay, if it's necessary, a second day. Uh, but there's obviously this concern is, uh, has been raised because there have been problems with people claiming to be a, an apostle and mooching off early Christian congregations as false apostles. You don't write these kind of warnings and instructions unless it's meant to address an existing problem. So if you're truly an apostle, you're only going to stay a day or two. If you stay three days, the congregation should consider that that person is a false apostle, a false prophet. They're just meaning to uh, take advantage of Christian communities to support them to give them food and money, uh, and that they aren't primarily there to teach the good news of the gospel. So if they stay three days, they're a false prophet. Now, even if they're a true prophet, when they leave, if you're, they're a true apostle, they, they won't be accepting anything from you except sufficient food to carry them to their next lodging. So they're going to, they're itinerant. They're going to move on from your village to another village. Don't give them money. If they ask for money, they're a false prophet. But give them enough support, food, what they need to get to the next town or the next village to carry them to their next lodging. But if they ask for money, they're a false prophet. All right, so much for these apostles who also are like prophets who speak out the word of God. He now says, what do we do? What should we do with people 
who are speaking by the Spirit, or at least they claim to be speaking by the Spirit. Well, he says in, in verse 7 of chapter 11, while a prophet is making ecstatic utterances, that is, speaking by the Spirit, speaking in a spirit, don't interrupt them, don't test them or examine them while they're speaking. You don't want to be guilty of a, an unforgivable sin of blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. He's using that saying of Jesus in this way to warn the congregation against treating a true prophet as if he were a false prophet. So just <clears throat> let them say what they're going to say. Don't examine them while they're saying it, but wait. However, not everybody making ecstatic utterances, not everyone speaking in the spirit is a prophet, but only if they behave like the Lord. That is, their conduct must be like Christ. They must have Christ-like conduct in their speech, in their treatment of other people. They must behave as if they were emulating the conduct of Christ. It is by their conduct that you can tell the difference between a true prophet and a false prophet. Even if the person is speaking by the Spirit, but they act differently, you should not pay attention to them. Then comes uh, a couple of sayings that really no one has ever figured out exactly what the Didacist intended. It's, it says that everyone who marks out a table in the Spirit, now that's literally what the text the Greek text of the Didache says, if anyone orders or marks out a table, one of the translations reads, orders a meal. That would be an interpretation of what it means to, to set apart or to order or mark out a table. Again, are we talking about the Lord's table, um, the altar? the place where the elements would be placed on of bread and wine? Or is this just an ordinary table in which the prophet is saying that he wants a Thanksgiving dinner, for example, in his speaking in the spirit, he marks out a table that's okay, but he must not eat from it. In other words, he must not do anything in his ecstatic speaking that is personally beneficial to him. That would be using the gift of speaking in tongues or, or speaking prophetically for his own advantage. If he does this, if he does mark out a table and eats from it, he is a false prophet. So every prophet who teaches the truth but doesn't practice what he preaches is also a false prophet. So the teaching could even be true. But if the person doesn't live by the teaching or doesn't have the character of Christ, then they're a false prophet. No one knows for sure what verse 11 means. I'll read it in this translation, but it's unclear to anyone now exactly what this means. Every attested and genuine prophet who acts with a view to symbolizing the mystery of the church and does not teach you to do all that he does must not be judged by you. His judgment rests with God. So let me read that in a, not, a different translation. Your translation may be different as well. So this is in chapter 11, and I'll read it to you in the translation by Cursip Lake in the uh, Library of Christian Classics from Harvard. But no prophet who has been tried and is genuine, even though he enact a worldly mystery of the church, 
if he does not teach others to do what he does himself, he shall be judged by you, for he has his judgment from God. For so also did the prophets of old. <coughs> One more time. But no prophet who has been tried and is genuine, though he enact a worldly mystery of the church, that's exactly what the Greek says, though he enact a worldly mystery of the church, if he does not, sorry, if he teaches not, if he teach not others to do what he himself does, that prophet shall not be judged by you, for he has his judgment with God, for so also did the prophets of old. <clears throat> the best I can come up with is that in some way, this prophet is by his actions symbolizing the mystery of Christ and the church, as Paul mentions in Ephesians chapter 5. He's somehow symbolizing the mystery, the unity of Christ and the church. If he does that, then his judgment about the propriety of that rests with God, not with you. You can't know for sure whether what he's doing is right or not. Leave that judgment up to God. But again, much remains unclear about this verse. If you had trouble with it, you are in league with everyone, even well-trained scholars of this period and this text are not sure exactly what this means. But he ends this section by saying, whoever shall say in the spirit, speaking by the spirit, give me money or give me something else, you shall not listen to them. But if he tells you to give on behalf of others, that's okay. Don't let anyone judge him. Finally, we deal with chapter 12 in the few minutes we have left. Let everyone who comes in the name of the Lord, now we're talking about traveling Christians, let everyone be welcomed. But when you have tested him, you shall know him, for you shall have understanding of true and false. So the congregation is told they have the ability to judge true and false teachers, prophets, apostles, or just traveling visitors. Now, if the person who comes is just a traveler, an itinerant, somebody on the road, they're not an apostle or a prophet, help them as much as you can. But they really shouldn't stay more than two or three days. Notice they could stay a third day if need be, unlike the apostles and prophets who, if they stay three days, they're false. But here, if a person stays more, um, that's okay. And in fact, if they wish to say, oh, this is a good community, I would like to live here, if they wish to settle among you, and they have a skill, let them work for their bread. In other words, they shouldn't be dependent on you past the two or three days that they stay. If they want to stay longer, then they need to work and to support themselves and others in the community. But if they don't have a craft, all right, then provide for them according to your own understanding. Use your best judgment so that no one shall live among you in idleness just because he is a Christian. In other words, they shouldn't traffic. That's what the next verse says. But if they won't do so, if they won't work and just want you to support them, then they are a Christ monger. They are making traffic of Christ. That is, they're using Christianity as a way to uh, coerce you indirectly to supporting them, even though they won't work. Beware of such people. Well, that's where we ended our discussion uh, today with the end of chapter 12. So next time we'll pick up 13, 14, 15, and conclude with 16. At least that's the plan. I can't see that that won't happen. Uh, I think that will be um, a good way to finish up our study of the Didache. And then we will move on to reading and discussing 
the letters of Ignatius of Antioch, the Bishop of Antioch, a mid early to mid second century Christian leader who was on his way to martyrdom in Rome and wrote letters back to seven churches that he felt responsible for or that he cared about. We'll pick up Ignatius of Antioch next. Thank you for being part of the Monday study group. I hope you have a good week and continue to um, reflect on the meaning of the Didache and how early Christians tried to live out their faith in their time with the challenges they had.